me all set. Good morning, everyone. Can you believe two weeks in a row we're sitting on the lawn like this? It's amazing. Whoever you are, wherever you come from, if this is your first time worshiping with us, welcome. If you've been here many times before, welcome back. Wherever you are in your spiritual journeys, whoever you love, and whatever is going on in your life, we're just so glad to be able to, to worship together this morning. And that includes you all here on the lawn, but also those who are worshiping at home this morning. So a warm welcome to everybody, no matter where you're worshiping. Uh, just a couple of announcements to get us started. Uh, first, a note about safety that, um, uh, Deirdre, is that too loud? Yeah. Um, we, uh, we do have bathrooms open this, uh, in the vestry. Um, if you don't need to use them, it's probably better. But if you do, please make, yourself, uh, make use of those. There are safety instructions um, in the bathroom and explain kind of the, you know, the, the, the safety procedures and, and how to keep everybody safe. So please do follow those. Um, we are not doing signups, uh, advanced registration as we've done in the past, but we do ask you to sign in as you come which gives us a contract tracing record, which is, which is helpful for a variety of different reasons. Um, when you arrive, you know, you find your flag as you have done. We've done in the past with our outdoor services, we waited for the deacons and ushers to release everybody, um, but we're gonna try not doing that. So after the service, just leave, giving plenty of space to those around you and you know, distancing, keep your masks on the whole time. And we're getting used to this, but it's always good to remind one another. So at the end of the service, I'll remind you again, but just carefully space yourself out as you go. Uh, tonight, we will have our confirmation class at five o'clock at the home of uh, the, the Bunting home in South Burlington. And we're looking forward to continuing that journey with our confirmants. Uh, looking forward to confirmation Sunday later in May. Our uh, men's group, Faith and Table, has been meeting for a whole year now, and we continue our second year. We meet on Mondays at six o'clock. We had started by meeting at Heinsberg Public House, but because of pandemic, we quickly moved inside and uh, have been meeting by Zoom. So if you would like to be part of that or to learn more about that, please do let me know and we'd love to have you. It's been just an incredibly wonderful group. And um, uh, if you're interested for connection with other men, please do let me know. Next Sunday, we plan again to worship outside. Uh, just like this. So here's the trick. On Saturday afternoons or and or Sunday mornings, just go to our church website and right on the very front of the homepage, Kim is going to put up a notice that says Sunday outside worship is on or Sunday worship is off. If it's off for weather or for spiking infection rates or for whatever reason, just check on Sunday morning. I'd hate for you to come here and have the service canceled. But as much as possible, we plan to be out here and to have a simple notification system so that you know what is going on. Certainly you can always contact me, leave a message at the church and I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Whatever happens with the weather, we will have our worship services streamed by Zoom and YouTube Live as we have for the past year. So if you're not coming or you're not sure about the weather or whatever it is, you can always log in from home, wherever you are, and we hope that you do. Uh, lastly, I just want to mention that we will be um, beginning a new members class on the, <clears throat> I guess that's the 26th, 28th, okay the 18th next Sunday. Okay. So next Sunday at three o'clock by zoom, we have a group of new members who will be starting that process. And so if you're interested in membership at Sherlock Congregational Church, come and talk to me and um, we can uh, tell you a little bit more about that process and, and what it takes. The cliff notes are, it doesn't take a whole lot of time. Um, and so we just like to get to know one another uh, in that setting and, uh, and, uh, and, and help people consider this church and the intersection of their faith life. So with that, enjoy this beautiful sunshine today, and may the spirit of Christ be real for each of us and all of us this morning. At this time, I'd like to invite Jim Hyde forward. Jim, are you here? Jim, I'm going to have you, we're, we're trying to have everyone have their own microphone these days. So Jim, we're going to have you go to the middle microphone if that works for you. Just be careful of all the cords. <laughs> This one? That one. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Good. Okay. I will take off my mask because my glasses fog up, and it's that's one of the one of the problems these days. So I'm Jim Hyde. I'm representing uh, missions here the, this morning, 
And five for five, I know it sounds a little like, like a baseball statistic, but five for five is shorthand for one of the ways that we here at uh, the Shalott Congregational Church carry out our mission. And as we all know, that mission is committing ourselves to prayerful and compassionate and courageous action in the world. And we do this in five ways, and that's why it's five for five. Number one, we support the core mission of UCC. And then we also support four other programs which UCC designates each year. And this year, there are two programs in particular we want to uh, highlight. One great hour of sharing, which focuses on global issues. And this year is focusing on water and water development issues in the third world. And Neighbors in Need. And Neighbors in Need is a, has a domestic focus. And Neighbors in Need is working with refugees and refugee resettlement this year as well. But the other thing that we're doing this year is we thought, what a great opportunity to remember two icons of this church, Marie Luer and Ann Bolowski. These are two individuals who really understood what it means to commit yourself to prayerful, uh, courageous action in the world. And sadly, they passed away last year and are not with us. But wait, what a great time to uh, remember them and remember the contributions that they made uh, here to the church. And Roger and Betsy Howland have put together a fabulous video along with Jeannie McDonough and Stephen Rose of remembrance of their lives and what they did while they were here at Shalott Congregational Church. And I hope some of you have already seen it. It's on the website. You can go click on that and watch that video. And uh, hopefully after today's service, if you haven't done so, you will. And hopefully you'll think about giving to one great hour of sharing and neighbors in need as part of the five for five program. And you can do that by making a check out to Shalak Congregational Church, putting on the memo line five for five, or you can click on, I think they call it a radio button on the website and you can use PayPal. And I hope as you do that, and as you think about making a contribution this year, you'll think about um, the contribution that these two women uh, made to all of our lives at, throughout their lives. So thank you very much. Good morning. Here our centering word from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he, showed, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the 12, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in, in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God, 
and through believing, you may have life in his name. The stone is rolled away, hallelujah, the stone is rolled away. The Lord is risen from the grave, the stone is rolled away. The stone is rolled away, hallelujah, the stone is rolled away. The Lord is risen from the grave, the stone is rolled away, hallelujah. Let all Christians give thanks and sing. Shout your praises to our King. The grave lost its victory and death its sting. The Lord has risen in me. Oh, hallelujah. The stone is rolled away. Hallelujah. The stone is rolled away. Hallelujah. The Lord is risen from the grave. The stone is rolled away. The stone is rolled away, hallelujah, the stone is rolled away. The Lord is risen from the grave, the stone is rolled away. The stone is rolled away, hallelujah, 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 the stone is We have to sit by our flags, but it's hard not to get up and dance to that song. Cameron and Allison were joined by um, brother and sisters, uh, A.J. Banach and his sister. Um, sister, do we remember? It's in the bulletin. Sorry about that. Got to get that right. Sorry, Julie Banach, who has sung with us before. And so anyway, we're grateful for them and their, uh, their talents. Join me in a, a prayer that I, I often use this time of year um, from Mark chapter 9, verse 24. Something about Easter and the mystery and the resurrection is just so incredibly unbelievable. So I love these lines from Mark 9, and I invite you to say those along with me, and then we'll say the Lord's Prayer together as well. As we say together, God, I believe, help my unbelief. And hear us as we pray. Our Mother, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh. 
Hi, kids. Can you hear me okay? Kids, if you would like to stand up and stretch your legs, you can do that now. You can even do jumping jacks, shake it out, whatever you need to do. I'm so glad, and we are so glad to see you this morning. So did you think it was a little bit strange that there are Easter eggs with Play-Doh in them again this morning? A little bit strange, because wasn't Easter last Sunday? Well, I have good news for you this morning. In the church, Easter is a whole season. It's 50 days, five zero days. Now, that doesn't mean that you get to eat chocolate bunnies and jelly beans for 50 days, but it does mean that you get to, we all get to think about new life and hope and God's wonderful love for 50 days. And that is pretty great. So the Bible story that you heard this morning is kind of exciting. And I, I want to highlight one thing for you. When the risen Jesus sees people again in the Bible story this morning, he says, you probably noticed, peace be with you. And he also says the, that God's spirit is with them. So I wonder if you have felt God's spirit with you. A few Sundays ago in Sunday school, we talked about that. And some kids felt God's spirit with them in a favorite swing or in a hammock or by a river or a stream. And those are all great places to feel God's spirit. But you know, another great place right here on Sunday morning with one another. And so I wonder, I want to invite you as you play with your Play-Doh this morning. And if you didn't get some, you can go get an egg with Play-Doh in it. But I want to invite you to just see if you can pay attention and feel God's spirit with you this morning. So should we, should we try it right now? Just take maybe three or four deep breaths and just listen and feel and pay attention and see if we can feel God's spirit. Let's give it a shot. Amen. Can you all hear me? Am I okay here? So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our time for prayer. I have a couple to raise before you. First, this has been uh, National Library Week. Perhaps not a lot of you have been into the libraries, but the work of the librarians and the people who um, staff our community libraries goes on. And we want to give special thanks this morning to Margaret Woodruff and Susanna Kahn and Cindy Robinson for their partnership with our church and for being such wonderful and exceptional community leaders. We are blessed by their presence among us. And prayers for Danny Garrett, David Garrett's brother, um, who is facing the last days of his life from pancreatic cancer, and particularly also for David and for Christy, who have gone to be with him at this tender time. So let us pray. Gracious, present, and loving God, dare we believe that spring is here? A month ago, we were so cocky, confident that a few warm days meant spring had arrived. We grabbed rakes, we changed tires, and we squinted at the sun. So sure were we that we'd paid the price in winter days of snow and ice. Sure, our debt was paid and done with one full day of radiant sun. Then time and again, we were kneecapped by the chill. Our confidence is weak this year. Accustomed as we've become to shifting sands and riding waves of change, 
and infection. Conditioned by uncertainty, we're not sure the daffodils are safe from pelting hail. We were ready for spring, eager and hopeful, but now that it's here, we tiptoe on cold grass, somewhat hesitant, untrusting, not quite daring to believe. And so it is with faith, O oh God, when hopes are dashed, lives rent asunder, a pandemic persists and variants thrive, we retreat, we pull back our hearts and our trust. How can this be, we ask? Yet hesitant again, we turn to you, not sure that you can hear, not sure that you care even sometimes. Where were you when he died? Where were you when she lied? Where were you when so discouraged we dreamed of running away? Where are you in the chill wind of warring nations? Where are you when small children die from starvation and disease and foul water across the globe? Where are you when he loads the gun? Impatient. We want resolution now here today. We want the pandemic to end and justice and peace to reign. We want the divisions in our country to heal. But deep beneath the surface of our unbelief, below our hesitancy, the roots of love shimmer on the tendrils of hope. Is this the Holy Spirit so elusive, so unseen that rests in the shadows of despair? that breathes life into weary bodies, that fills our eyes with sweet salt tears. We give you thanks for the constancy of your love, though we may not always feel or see it. Help us to rest on the fluttering, translucent wings of hope that bear the weight of the world. Amen. Continue our worship with a time for us to reflect on the offering of our gifts to this church community, but not just to this church community, to all the ways in your life that God calls you to let the abundance flow through you and outward into the world. So with that, friends, let us be together in prayer. This sun-kissed morning, God, reminds us of your presence, fills us with joy, we thank you for relationships and for connections. We're deeply grateful for all that's good and right and true in the world. So from our gratitude, let that bubble up to become uh, giving of our time, of our money, and uh, a service to one another. In that way, help us to accomplish your vision, God, of the new Jerusalem, of beauty and love ever flowing for everyone. Amen.
Here now, as we hear the radical, the story of radical community in the early church from the Acts of Apostles, chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. May God bless this reading and hearing. Amen. This week, it was all vaccine all the time in my household. On Monday uh, morning, the vaccine portal for those in my age group opened up. And St. Deirdre, early on Monday, was uh, sitting in front of her computer, refreshing her browser like a teenager trying to get concert tickets. And uh, she was able to get me, I don't know, a couple hours, able to get me an appointment for Wednesday. So I got my shot, my first shot this past Wednesday, just 24 hours after Deirdre got her shot. And our son, uh, who's away at college, Owen, uh, got his shot. It was all vaccine all the time for me and my family this past week, which got me to thinking. It got me thinking about the, uh, the often contentious and long vaccine history in this country. It got me thinking of my mom, who has a smallpox scar on her arm. And my whole life, she celebrated that to me as a mark of safety from a terrible disease. I remember when uh, Owen was a baby back in the early 2000s, there was a rekindling of the anti-vaccine movement in this country. And uh, there were more than a few of the young couples that Deirdre and I were uh, familiar with who were choosing not to have their children vaccinated. It was all vaccine all the time for me at my house this week. And it got me reading about the partisan politics of it all and the looming fight over vaccine passports. It got me studying uh, about the, the, the data that indicates that white communities are being vaccinated at higher rates than Bi BIPOC communities, and that many in those BIPOC communities are more likely to want to be vaccinated than those in the white communities. I got me to reading as well about the fact that across demographics, 30% of all adults in this country are planning not to be vaccinated against COVID-19. It was all vaccine all the time in my house this week and in our culture more generally. And um, it made me realize, it raised my awareness of the need that we have in this culture to talk about vaccinations and that it's increasingly unsafe for us to do that. Let's pray. Loving God, it's a beautiful morning and we are gathered together in this way online or in person for congregational worship to give you thanks and praise and to connect with one another. But this isn't just a nice morning and <clears throat> a nice, quiet, prayer-filled hour, but this is a time we get to break over the, open the word to engage topics that matter, difficult topics, contentious topics perhaps, but searching for your gospel wisdom and your gospel light through it all. So thank you for calling us to this place and this time, and thank you for the beauty of your powerful word. Amen. So as I just said, I think it's increasingly unsafe for us to talk about vaccines in our culture, and yet I'm convicted that it is, there's too many lives and too many livelihoods at stake for us to remain silent about it. So this seemed to me like a really wonderful and important opportunity for us to practice talking about vaccinations with one another so that when we leave this place, we can have these sometimes often difficult conversations with those in our households, our friends, our neighbors, our family members, and those in the wider community. So. I will start off by saying 
that um, that sorry, it's 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 been a muddled conversation in my brain about vaccinations. There's so many things to think about, and I might have trouble keeping it all in my brain. So please forgive me as I go. But I better bring up my phone and look at my notes real quick. Excuse me. Yeah, thank you. So I thought it was important for us to talk about vaccinations in light of the gospel and as this one community in faith. And that word community is a really important one, right? It's a word that's familiar to us, and it is so often on our lips. We talk about being in this community against the pandemic. We talk about being a community of faith, a community of faith in partnership with the wider community of South Burlington and North Ferrisburg and Charlotte and Shelburne and Hinesburg and beyond. Community is such a familiar word, and it's so often on our lips And yet, I don't think it's a surprise to any of us here that we in our culture in this country, in general, and in New England in particular, that communal thinking is often secondary to us. And it comes sometimes even unnaturally to us. Our natural state, the way we're conditioned in our culture, is to think first and most naturally about the individual and the I. We're all about pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and about individual freedoms. We're about personal responsibility and personal faith and personal finances. And we are biased towards the I and against the we, which means a whole lot of things. But one of the things it means is that we bring our, the, our I lenses to this debate about vaccinations. Rightly, we ask, is this vaccine safe for myself and for my family? We wonder if these vaccinations and the programs and the the pharmaceutical companies and the government process, is that in line with my politics? Is that in line with my faith? And does that impinge on my personal freedoms? We wonder if I have access to the vaccine portal and the time and the energy and the time away from work and the transportation, do I have what I need to be vaccinated? And we tend to filter vaccinations through our bias towards the eye unwittingly without even realizing that. And the dynamic that that creates, I think, is one eye butting up against another person's eye, and there's precious little conversation about what's good for my neighbor, what's good for the other, and what's good for all of us. And so we have one eye butting up against another eye, and we see this played out over and over again with conflict and debate and anger through conversations and through emails and on front porch forum. And, and this dynamic is just um, leads us down the road of contention and scapegoating and shaming one another. And ultimately it often too often ends with one group coercing another group, those with the more most power coercing themselves on the others. And this dynamic gets played out time and again, not just when it comes to vaccinations, but in so many other areas of our life together, gun violence and immigration and healthcare, and the list goes on and on and on and on. And so what we do is we get a dynamic in this country that is focused on the vaccine and I, not the vaccine and we. We get a vaccine and I bias rather than a vaccine and we. And I think that brings us to a place that's made for the stuff of split screen cable news channels. It's the stuff of politics and politicians who wither in an environment of win-win and thrive in an environment of win-lose. It is not the stuff of creative solutions and of community building and the common good. 
And I don't think it is at all the stuff of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what is of the gospel of Jesus Christ is Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35, a word that I think has much to say to us in this current environment. Just a bit of history here that in Acts chapter 4, Jesus has left, and he's left this ragtag band of his followers in this fledgling Christian community to try to figure out how to carry on. The problem is, is that in so many ways, they're vulnerable. Remember, it's a Christian group that is broken away from the Jewish tradition, so they are at odds with the Jewish authorities and odds with the Jewish community. Their leader, Jesus, was killed through Roman crucifixion, and so they're under constant threat from Rome, and in pretty much every way, they are vulnerable economically, socially, politically, religiously, and in every way. At the same time, this vulnerable community was biased towards the we in a way that we in our culture cannot possibly imagine. As Jewish Christians, they were steeped in the language of covenant, the relationship between God and God's people. The relationship is never between God and the individual. It's never between God and the personal. It's always between God and the community. Saving is between God and the community. It is always about the we. And so what we do is we have this early Christian community that comes from this culture. And because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they don't abandon the we, they double down on the we, they radicalize the we into the kind of community that the New Testament knows as koinonia community, a mutually indwelling, a mutually sacrificial community that uh, benefits everybody who's involved in that. It brings life to everybody. Everybody was together. All of the believers had one heart and mind, we hear in Acts. They gathered the resources together and they distributed those to any as had need. So they radicalized the we and they doubled down on the we. Now, it's important from here to recognize that the vision that we have in Acts 4 is an idealized view of community. It doesn't matter what culture you're from, an I culture or a we culture, people fight and we disagree and we fight for power and we fight for resources. And certainly that happened in the early Christian community. But still, this vision that we have in Acts chapter 4 is vital and essential for us because it lays out for us the promise that in and through Jesus Christ, we can become more and more a community of people that benefits not just some of us, but that benefits all of us. So there's a tension between the gospel light of Acts chapter 4 and the gospel light that shines down upon us in our culture as we filter everything through the eye, which is precisely why I wanted to talk about this with you today. So I'm thankful for the sun. I'm thankful for this time. I'm thankful for us to be able to practice talking about vaccinations, but I don't want it to end here right? It's vital that we take our beliefs in the light of the gospel out into the wider world and that we have these hard conversations. And to do that, I want to leave you with a word of encouragement, a word of caution, and a word of hope. First, the word of encouragement. I just want to encourage everybody here today from a firm conviction about the science and then the light of the gospel, I don't want to encourage everybody here today in conversation with your medical professionals to get vaccinated. I think that is the most powerful way that we can protect one another. And as you have your own hesitancies and your own concerns, I invite you to do your research and to think not only about what's good for you and who you know, but what's good for your neighbor and those people that you will never meet. And I encourage you to be vaccinated. Second, I offer us all a word of caution. There are lots of emotions about this topic. There are lots of deeply held convictions about this topic on all sides. And when we meet one another, butting up against one another, and we shame one another, and we berate one another, and we attempt to coerce one another, That leads us as far away from Acts chapter 4 and the vision of Koinonia community that we can possibly get. 
So as we talk about this and think about this and research and make our own decisions about what we're going to do, when we meet our neighbors or those in our own households who have a different opinion, or even when we fight ourselves as we're figuring out what we're going to do about it, I invite us to meet one another with openness, with gentleness, and with great care for the beloved child of God you are in conversation with. Lastly, I just want to offer us a word of hope and something I'm very excited about. Uh, just about a year ago in Charlotte, a group of folks began meeting called Charlotte Community Partners. We came together in response to the pandemic, and we've met every two weeks since to resource one another, to plan together, uh, to uh, engage in a resilience assessment, which is going on right now. But this last week, we, had, um, uh, we, we initiated an effort called Charlotte Vax Help. And uh, Jim Hyde wrote an article about this in Sherlock News this past week, which details this, that the Sherlock community partners, partners, many of these folks, you know, Margaret Woodruff and Jim Hyde and myself and about 15 or 16 others are very active in that group. And we are embarking upon an awareness campaign to get the word out about vaccines. There is a um, a phone number and uh, an email address uh, detailed in that Sherlock News article. And so if folks have non-medical questions about the vaccine, if they need help navigating the vaccine portals, we have folks who can help them to do that and to sign up. And we also have vaccinated drivers who are willing to drive anybody who wants to be vaccinated to go and do that. So it is just a grassroots group of committed charlotters who are working in an acts for way, a commitment to vaccine in we, to help get vaccines in arms and to keep us all safe. Okay, so that's what's on my heart this morning. The sermon is at an end. And I just encourage us all to go forward with encouragement, with caution, and with hope. And may that all result for all of us in shots and arms and all of us safer against the pandemic. Amen. Now what
So let's try something here. Uh, if, as you are able and feel moved, I invite you to stand up for our benediction. And groups speaking at this point is a little challenging, but we can do actions, right? So maybe we cross our arms as a sign of love for our neighbors. And maybe we just spin around in a circle, and meet one another's eyes, just let them know we miss and we love and we would hug if we could. <laughs> and for love of neighbor, God, we ask for your blessings to be upon us. Send us into the world with open hearts, with gentleness, and with great care for our neighbor. Because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Help us to be a koinonia community for the life of us all. Go in peace. Amen. You can stand or be seated for our choral amen, which uh, we heard last week from our choir. And after that, I just invite you to um, disperse safely and slowly. Amen.